Take a helicopter, a cross-country truck and a chainsaw, the two top wildlife vets in Africa, a driven Englishman and a wayward Russian pilot and his ancient aircraft. And the most endangered of Africa's large mammals. The result is the effort that went into re-establishing the black rhino in its ancestral home. lies in the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro on the northern boundary of Tanzania. Its name means the place of no water. game reserve since 1951. It was ruined almost beyond redemption by poaching and overgrazing during the 70s and 80s. In 1988, the Tanzanian government invited Tony Fitzjohn to restore the habitat and its wildlife. Among his first moves was to establish a fenced area within the reserve, enclosing what was to become the Mukumazi Rhino Sanctuary. Fitzjohn's first surveys showed that the reserve still contained a remnant of its once flourishing population of game animals. With the support of the local African population, he began the arduous task of healing the damage caused by 30 years of degradation, a slow and frustrating process punctuated by short periods of frenzied activity. Among them was the return of the first black rhino Mukumazi. At the beginning of the poaching epidemic in 1961, four East African black rhino had been moved for safety to Addo Elephant National Park in South Africa. Using funds raised by public subscription, Fitzjohn arranged to buy four of their offspring and to move them back home into his new sanctuary. The mayhem had begun. Finding and darting the rhino in Addo was fairly straightforward under the guidance of Africa's two leading wildlife vets, Pete Morkel and Cobus Roth. <laughs> Gallons of water keep it cool, and oxygen helps it to breathe. They didn't know it then, but bringing the rhinos to Mukomazi was to prove far from routine an adventure beyond their wildest dreams. Wildlife medicine in South Africa is a well-developed science. A section cut from the rhino's ear will not only mark it for future identification, it will also provide DNA for tests to make certain that it is truly of original East African stock. Yes, 
the shoulder back to the neck. They handle the huge comatose rhinos as confidently as a farmer treats a favorite cow. Some just have an empty gut, you know, there's just no food that day, but the condition is quite good. So it's something The important detail is to remove the sharp tip of the rhino's front horn to avoid the risk of injury to other captive rhinos later. Being made of hair, the horn will grow back in a matter of months. So too will the bush. They move the four rhinos to a boma, a holding pen where they can recover from the experience while they await the next stage of their journey. The antidote to the tranquilizer takes effect very quickly. Within a few days, two males and two females are in the boma, ready to be moved to Mokomazi. Tony Fitzjohn came to Mukamazi at the request of the Tanzanian government. But he wasn't picked out of the blue. He came from a most unorthodox background, yet one that prepared him perfectly for the job he was asked to do. In 1968, at the age of 22, he left his rather aimless existence in London and hitchhiked to Kenya with the sole aim of working with wild animals. His dream was to come true. He sought out the guru of African conservation in those days, George Adamson, a most extraordinary man. George Adamson became famous with the publication in 1960 of his wife Joy's book, Born Free, describing their work in rehabilitating and releasing the orphan lion Elsa into the Kenyan bush. In 1970, to continue his work, he moved to Cora, where Tony Fitzjohn became his right-hand man. He remembers those days with deep gratitude. George was also most extraordinary. He welcomed anybody into his camp and let them stay as long as they wanted to or needed to. And as far as I'm concerned, he gave me everything. He gave me the chance to do well, he gave me the chance to mess up, um, learn by my mistakes or not learn by them. 
and uh, you know, never, never a strong word, never a cross word. Sometimes the odd look. It would also never really tell you anything. It'd show you and, and set an example. And it was up to you to um, <laughs> work it out for yourself. Very tough old boy, beneath that lovely, uh, gentle, calm exterior. Um, was that good old fashioned philosophy that every man makes it for himself in this world? Um, man lives, but lives by his own principles and by his own lights. Um, there are no shortcuts, no easy ways. And you just have to, you know, cope for yourself and, and not blame anybody else and just get on and do things. When Born Free was made into a successful film starring Virginia McKenna and her husband Bill Travers, whose lives were also changed by their contact with the Adamsons, nothing much changed at Cora. The work went on for 18 years. During that time, Adamson and Fitzjohn succeeded in releasing more than 30 lions and 10 leopards into the wild. They developed a game reserve at Cora fighting off ivory poachers and Somali bandits. In 1989, when he was 83, the bandits murdered George Adamson. By then, Tony Fitzjohn was already working at Mokomazi. He is one orphaned lioness of his own, Jippy, who is growing up much as the Adamson's lions did, being prepared for release but following her progress when she's set free will not be so hard as it was in the Cora days, when the work was done on foot in the bush. It was long, hard days to try and find our friends in charge, to find out where they'd gone. Um, GP here will benefit from modern technology and hopefully we'll have a collar on her fairly soon, so we know where she's gone to. As well as being important for conservation, his work with the lions keeps him in the public eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. What are we doing? We're posing for the camera. In 1975, Tony Fitzjohn came close to death after being mauled by one of the Cora lions. But it only increased his determination to carry on George's work. This is just like the um, old days with uh, George Adamson. The sun rises, we open the gate, Jippy goes out. Yeah, George would put his pipe in his mouth. Sadly, I smoke cigarettes. Um, and off we go through the bush, you know, and learn all the sights and sounds and smells, and Jippy slowly grows up, and it's a long, slow process back into the world. One little lion is a full-time job. But the great thing here is great staff. Yeah, I'm very blessed with these guys. Another of the projects at Mokumazi is the rescue from extinction of the African hunting dog. He has several small breeding packs at Mokumazi ready for eventual release. What amazes me about these dogs here is that um, their whole social activity is exactly the same as it is in the wild, even though it's in a very restricted area. They're very non-apathetic, um, and they get on and live their lives out. They communicate with each other, with the different groups, by sound. You know, in about a year's time, we're going to be ready to seriously start putting some back into the wild. Sangeeta, who's the head dog keeper here, um, is an extraordinary man. He more or less volunteered for the job. He was on the original capture and has looked after them ever since as head dog keeper. I don't really interfere. He comes to me if, if there's a bit of a problem. We do all the vaccinations together. We prove that breeding can be done in a, in a, in a fairly remote bush situation like this. All that separates these, these dogs from the wild is this little flimsy bit of chain link. And they can easily break out if they want to. captive rhino have rather less chance of breaking out of their boma, though they certainly want to. They've calmed down somewhat since being captured, 
and the time has come to move them to Mukumazi in crates specially designed for the job. Their transport might also be uncharitably described as a crate. It's an antiquated Russian Antonov aircraft. The rhino crates will fit into its hull with a little maneuvering and the occasional minor accident. But the aircraft has a second skin, so the damage is negligible. Getting the rhinos into the crates is no problem for the vets. As the exterior crew waits, the inside men lower the rhino gently onto its side. Eyes bandaged and ears blocked, it lies peacefully waiting to be moved into position while the scientists monitor its vital signs. Pulse and breathing are checked by the latest in electronic monitors, but moving the giant beast relies on good old-fashioned muscle power. When it's correctly lined up, the vet administers the antidote. One by one, the four rhino will be crated and moved to the airfield and the waiting Antonov. Tony Fitzjohn's plan is about to enter its next stage. Back at Mokomazi, he's ready to receive his newest protege. Something of a change from the lions that have occupied his attention for the last 27 years. Well, why rhino? I mean, I, th I have to confess that the lions are the biggest love I have in the animal kingdom, having spent so long with them. But rhinos simply needed the most help. Um, Tanzania in 1975 had 10,000 plus rhino. By 1990, they were down to two dozen individuals. Um, it was quite a daunting task to think of, of putting in a sanctuary and buying all the rhino. Luckily, there was a supply from South Africa that uh, we could get our hands on. Um, and the whole plan gelled and, and came together. In the event, it very nearly came apart. After the small mishap during the test loading of the crates, the actual job goes smoothly.
Four rhinos are a trivial load in the enormous hold of the Antonov, one of the biggest cargo planes in the world. Lights of South Africa behind, they head off north over the bush to Tanzania, where Tony Fitzjohn awaits them on the carefully prepared landing strip at Mukumazi. As the night passes, all is not well. Not to put too fine a point on it, they can't land at Mukamazi. The airstrip is shrouded in rain clouds, and they're doubtful about its condition even if they could see it. Their equipment tells them that the nearest airport is Kilimanjaro. They decide to put down and wait for better weather. Thus it is that the rhinos destined for Mukamazi make their first, though unscheduled, landing in the north. At least they're in the right country. Meanwhile, Tony Fitzjohn waits and watches at Mukamazi. He has customs and immigration all lined up to deal with the aircraft and its precious cargo. All that's missing is the aircraft and its cargo. You can hear an Antonov coming from miles away, but the sky stays silent. At Kilimanjaro, the customs and immigration people are having a field day. An unannounced Russian aircraft claiming to be carrying rhinos is a solid day's entertainment. For the rhinos and their carers, it is no joke. Food and water must be found or the rhinos will suffer. Tired of waiting, Tony has called the Wildlife Division and found that the Antonov is at Kilimanjaro. He will have to go and find it and lead it to Mokumazi. I think that's the major. Okay. Kilimanjaro Airport is predominantly grassland and the shrubs and bushes that the rhinos need to eat are hard to find. The wardens have to gather what they can from the rough ground beside the runway. Unless they can move on soon, the rhinos are going to be very hungry. An hour 
later, Tony arrives, relieved at least to find the Antonov is in one piece. He explains to the Russian pilot how to find Mokomazi. About 2,500 feet. And you'll see the breaks in the cloud. The airstrip is a mile long, 1.7, 1.8 kilometers long, and it's wide. And we've got a break in the weather like this, it's drying out now. Runway 11, and just stick it on the end of 11. And that's all very, very hard. At the far end is that little bit of rain, it's a little bit skinny, but you'll stop by there. Would you like to see the, the ONC map? Yeah. Would you like to look at the map? Yeah. You haven't got an ONC? Sir, are you keeping? Across here to sorry, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly, and our airstrip is here. It's um, zero four zero five zero three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's here. Yeah, but you come down over here. They agree that Tony will lead the way until the Russian pilot can see the strip. Following his diminutive plane, the Antonov takes off. familiarity, Tony touches down on the first hard part of the strip, praying that the Russian will be able to do the same. comes a little closer than anyone had been expecting, runs out of earth and takes the grass. Tony was right when he said he was a little skiddy. Navigator in the nose of the Antonov, it was a landing to remember. We made three orbits. Yes. When everything and everyone stops shaking, unloading can begin. Dreams can come true, not always quite as you might expect.
last the four black rhino, among 40 descendants of the four that left here 36 years ago, have returned to Tanzania. The welcoming committee have regained their composure after the rhino's dramatic arrival. But composure is soon thrown to the winds as they congratulate Tony and his wife Lucy on their achievement. The vets take over for the next and the last crucial stage of the journey. a certain lightheadedness after what seemed impossible comes to pass. Let me tell you, I was impressed with that little pilot. Did he land that? It's the biggest compliment you ever paid me, darling. Get the meat cake. They have set up a boma here too to receive the rhinos and to protect them as they recover from their journey. Good job. you can just swing it slightly. All four are safely unloaded and they appear in good health, if not all in good temper. <laughs> The next stage of the restoration of Mukumazi is underway. And then. So what do you want to do? Do you want to stay down here and then come up the second and come back down again? But if they are ever to regain the use of the airstrip, the Antonov will have to be moved. Okay, and you want to try now? Yeah. No, uh, we uh, start uh, up and uh, turn departure. around here. Yeah, turn, turn here turn. and uh, departure. And take off. Now, now, now. Now, yeah. Now 18 months later, and all is not as Tony Fitzjohn had hoped. Fly as he might over the sanctuary, he can find no sign of the rhinos. The cover is too dense, perfect for rhinos, but where are they? Are they there at all? He catches a glimpse of the elephant Nina, safely returned to the wild from a zoo. There's no sign of Charlie, Rose, James, or Jomo, names they've given to the rhinos. In such a huge area, without the aid of radio collars, keeping track of the rhinos has proved impossible. They watch Nina ambling away into the bush, and dreadful doubt begins to assail Tony's mind. Poaching has become less recently, largely because there are so few rhinos and elephants to hunt. But the threat has not disappeared. The publicity generated when the rhinos arrive might have been just the challenge that poachers were waiting for.
One evening, an alarm sounds in the house. The electric fence surrounding the sanctuary has been broken. Anxiously, Tony and his team set out to check the fence. They are all armed. Poaching is a highly profitable occupation carried out by ruthless men. has been displaced at the base of one of the posts, shorting out the current. This was what triggered the alarm. On the ground, there are signs of a fight. Not far away stands the winner. They conclude that the stone was dislodged in the struggle to kill the giraffe. It was a false alarm, but they are still no nearer to finding the rhinos. They leave the lions to their meal. Okay, come on, John. Next morning, Tony calls South Africa to speak to one man he knows who might help him, the vet Pete Morkel. They agree that the rhinos must be fitted with some form of radio transmitter so that their progress can be followed in the vastness of the sanctuary. Pete will come to carry out the complex, but to him, routine operation. Two weeks later, the operation is underway. The helicopter can search the bush more thoroughly than the fixed-wing aircraft. But still, the task is not easy. So, yeah. Yeah, they are. Keeping in touch with the ground crew by radio, the helicopter quarters the sanctuary. There are four rhinos out there, somewhere. For the man on the ground, it's a long wait for the news that the first one has been found. At last they find one. It's James. Okay, got him. He's right in front of us. He's right in front of us. One on us. Okay, guys, we'll see you. The Land Rovers set off into the bush, heading for the place where Pete Morkel saw the rhino. Once the dart has been fired, Pete must keep track of the rhino and guide the land party so that they can get to it as soon as it falls. In the dense cover, this is not easy. As 
not be left lying unconscious on the ground for more than a few minutes. Knowing that the Land Rover is still some way off, Pete drops to the Rhino's assistance. Okay, Tony, he's gone down. I'm just dropping Dr. Vogel and I'll come and fetch you guys. Okay, um, I can see you. Tony tries to reach the harboring helicopter as best he can. You must make your way in, okay? George Adams' words, there are no shortcuts in the bush. Finally, the ground crew and Pete Morkel are reunited beside the somnolent body of James. They have decided not to dart the females. If, as they hope, they are pregnant, the drug might harm their unborn babies. The purpose of the operation is to insert radio transmitters into the front horns of the two males. As usual, keeping him cool is important. Tony Fitzjohn is moved by being reunited with James after he's lived contentedly for 18 months in the bush. The insertion of the radio transmitter will involve some heavy-duty drilling, but since the horn is made of hair and he's anaesthetized, James will feel nothing. The vet will monitor his vital signs throughout the operation. What are you checking for here, Pete? It's strange to think that the shavings that the drill removes would probably pay for the whole operation ten times over. Fragments of rhino horn, much smaller than this, sell for a fortune in the Far Eastern medical market, where it is regarded as a potent medicine. This is the main reason for the downfall of the world's rhinos. Drilling out these spiraling flakes is like printing thousand dollar bills. Tony checks the transmitter before it is put inside the horn. The aerial goes in vertically. The whole device will be invisible when the job's complete. The tiny transmitter will fit neatly into the hole after the aerial has been slipped up to the tip of the horn. The hole will be sealed with resin so that the transmitter will not fall out as James shoulders his way through the bush. Already the radio is sending out the staccato signals that will reveal where he is whenever Tony needs to know. <laughs> the 
because of the radio transmitters on the animals in the bushes so incredibly thick. It's been a wonderful example of cooperation between people on foot in the ground, who are unarmed, you must remember, um, and, the, and the people in the air. And um, extraordinary day. Extraordinary day for, for a job like this in conditions like this. The job done, it's time to wake James. Pete Morkel suggests how they should behave. I would be inclined to let him get up and, and, and he is well. If you, as he stands up, if you start up, he's going to probably turn around and come for you. Shall I not keep the engine running from now? No, no, I think that's more inclined. I think it starts easily. I think it's more inclined that he stands up, he hears the noise, he comes for you. I think he's aimed that way, he's going to stand up and almost certainly head off that way. Okay. If you stay nice and quiet. It seems to be... The breeze is coming from this way, so I, I think just keep quiet. Be ready there with the old. Okay, thank you. Granted. Pete Morkel may know his rhinos, but he's still a very brave man. He knows how fast the antidote takes effect. When they return to camp, Tony Fitzjohn is a happy man. He relives the day with Pete Morkel. What, were you worried at any time about anything that was going on there? It, it was a bit tricky. Uh, the bush is obviously extremely thick at the moment. It is, it's pretty humid um, and it can get quite hot during the day. Uh, I think our biggest concern was that we'd actually lose sight of the rhino after darting it. it, it uh, and that almost happened with It the almost happened, well in fact with both of them, it was, it was yeah. tricky. But other than that, no, I was pretty happy. Luckily, there wasn't as much water as I thought. I thought there was going to be much more water around, so that was good. The, um, the second animal, Jono, he was pretty close to a puddle. When he, he, just before he went down, about 50 meters before he went down, he actually walked through a puddle, eased out the other side, and then went down. So that we were lucky then. Well, great. And what sort of condition did you find them? Excellent. In the... no, excellent. They've got a lot of ticks on but one would pretty much expect it. This time of the year, towards the end of the rainy season. Um, a lot, but not excessive. No, the condition's excellent. Fantastic. James and Joma are in good condition and their future is in safe hands. To make those hands safer still is the ultimate aim of the Mokumazi project. As well as developing and restoring the sanctuary in the reserve, Tony and the George Adamson Trust have built a school for the village people. The return of the rhino to Mukumazi is a huge achievement. The urge that drives men like George Adamson and Tony Fitzjohn will find its fulfillment when the Africa that they loved is once more as secure as when they first fell in love with it. <laughs>